Hello, and welcome to the IMS Insights Podcast. I'm your host, Adam Bloomberg. Today, we're speaking with IMS Senior Jury Consultant, Dr. Arif Jabor, about visual storytelling, early jury research insights, and the importance of mental health and mentorship in the legal field. Dr. Jabor applies clinical psychology and research expertise to numerous cases, including product liability, white collar crime, toxic tort, catastrophic injury, and complex business litigation. He has published and presented numerous works on jury research, juror perceptions, voir dire strategy, and nuclear verdicts. I wanted to get your thoughts on storytelling. And I think it's it's one of the areas where TV kind of has it right with, with, with movies and 30 minute shows. It's always about a good story. These successful trial attorneys that you and I get to work with are excellent storytellers. Can you describe the role of storytelling in today's trials? Absolutely. Uh, it's an art, right? It's an art. And I approach it and I remind uh, attorneys all the time. You know and you live your cases for years sometimes. The, the jurors don't know your cases and they're going to live your case for maybe two weeks, maybe three weeks, maybe longer in some cases. So it's incumbent on you and the lawyers to make sure that all, as many, all of the facts, everything fits together in a way that people can uh, repeat to each other and understand. And we all know, we all, storytelling has been, it, it's basically in our DNA. And that's one of the ways that we process information and remember information. So the, the trial lawyer that understands their case really well is also the trial lawyer that is able to put the pieces together to convey it to the triers of fact who don't know anything about the case. I mean, oftentimes we have attorneys who say, well, if we present all of this information to them, they should understand that we didn't do anything wrong or there's no issue here. While the converse should be, if we present this universe of information tied together this way, then people will feel empowered that they understand what happened and that they would feel confident that they understand it happened this way because things unfolded in that, in, in this process, so on and so forth. And they tie all of the pieces together. That's the critical component. There's a lot of witnesses. There's a lot of evidence. There's a lot of documents. But how do they all tie together? And what's the organizing structure, right? And that's why we often work with lawyers to say, okay, you know, these pieces and these witnesses fit together when you're discussing this topic. And it relates to this topic. And this has this information in it. And it just relates to this topic and so on to the end point of reaching this, you know, the verdict that's favorable. And here's why. Do you have any more examples of good storytelling? Let's say even if it's a case that may not be as interesting to people as like a copyright infringement case, right? It's not something that's typically portrayed on TV or in, or in the movies. So what we, what I've advised clients is, okay, well, let's, let's set up some organizing questions, right? to of so what this case is about or who knew what when and what are the key issues here and what's uh what evidence does the other side have that uh, it why is it that the evidence that the other side has is is not relevant or is not uh, uh critical and then you you present these questions and you tell you're telling the jurors in the opening statement we're going to walk through these issues walk through these questions and you're going to and I explain to you the components of each one as then we go on as the evidence unfolds and the arguments unfold. And you will see that the answer to this question should be this, this, and that, and so on and so on and so forth to reach the end point of there is no harm here, no harm done here. Now, what that does, or at least in a particular case, like, like an infringement case where there's a lot of complicated issues, uh, document in, uh, intense uh, issues, uh, lots of expert witnesses on both sides. You have to bring people back to what I find useful, these critical questions that they, they understand. What is this related to? It's related to this question and this issue. What is that related to? It's related to this question and that issue. And as the story unfolds, and then people then feel, oh, well, I realize that the evidence they're putting is actually completely irrelevant uh, for this infringement matter. And it's actually baseless. And it's actually very uh, 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 unreliable, and they see that, and and almost you can uh, you can see in some people's faces, or hope to see in some people's faces, an aha moment where they 
understand that I, I feel like I understand what the issues are here. I have a good grasp and I'm confident in saying that there's no, there's no wrongdoing here because the lawyer presented it in a way that empowered me to, to uh, understand their story and be able to you know, relate to the others. How do visuals play a role in storytelling? Uh, they're absolutely critical because you know anybody can put words on, on a slide and sort of ask people questions. But then if you're presenting complex concepts to them in a visual way, and that's another another example, you know, we may have practice visuals. We do mocks or research projects, and we we present uh, graphics to jurors. And if they don't portray a particular concept in a simple enough manner, then we learn and we say we need to simplify this a lot more, less arrows going different places, less components, maybe less or more animation, so that we learn that to, to convey these messages truly, they need to understand how it relates to a topic or a question, but a graphic representation will add even more to, to how well they remember that. And that's a critical component of, of how we relay the words to the graphs, to the ultimate arguments that we need to the jurors to understand. Yeah, it, it, it's a fine line you've got to walk and trial. You know, your example about intellectual property cases is a great one. Clearly, in those cases, you've got, you know, sometimes really dense topics, uh, uh, patents that you have to show and and how a technology worked and did it or did it not infringe. Uh, or sometimes you have a simple case. You know, you might have just a slide with text, details, credibility, common sense, and, and maybe sometimes a simple picture works you know, the iceberg image used by a defense lawyer in opening, you know, plaintiff counsel has just presented their case, but there's more to the story. You know, we kind of have to figure out how, when, and where to use a visual, but it sure seems like most cases can use a good visual. What about cases where we have disturbing images or videos? And I'm thinking of, let's say, premise liability cases, an injury or worse, some sort of fatality has happened. How do you advise trial teams to approach showing that to the jury? I generally like to tell um, lawyers that to reach out to the jury as much as possible in, in, in telling them and asking them that, they, that you know, we need their help. We need to help to figure out what happened in this case because one side thinks one thing or the other side thinks, may think something completely different. And so in that process, in, in sort of communicating to the jurors that we were empowering them, to telling them, asking them for their help, asking them for their contributions, we tell them that we need to show them or explain to them the parameters of what happened. And we warn them or we tell them that there may be some things that might be disturbing. But again, in the context of educating them, empowering them, and asking for their help. And in doing that and making sure that they can help us help the lawyers as much as possible, we need to educate them on what happened, where it happened, and how things look. And you know, and if there's particularly disturbing images, then we have to you know, show them as quickly as possible, or at least be know, know exactly what needs to be said when something is presented, rather than sort of ramble or not know what to say if something up there is, um, is put up. But in my opinion, the most important thing is to tell the jurors why the, the images are being shown, what the purpose of them is, how it would help them to understand the case and how it would help them to decide uh, the ultimate uh, the issues and how it would help them to decide the ultimate issues in the favor of our clients. So let's shift gears. What are some trends you see coming relating to jury consulting and how you conduct research projects? It's, it's clear that there, there's a higher frequency now of projects that are done online. I mean, we have the capability to do that. Uh, and it gives us perhaps, it gives more clients more access to do research more frequently. Uh, cuts on costs and you can still get the same quality of data. And, um, and you can actually do these kinds of projects or anticipate or hope that there'll be more research done online earlier in the life cycle of a matter rather than for clients and attorneys to think that the research is only going to come when it's trial critical. The trial is looming, for example. So a, a trend that I may be pushing for or hoping for is that the, the paradigm shifts where uh, our more, more attorneys think that jury research 
is not just mock trials to get ready for trial. It's a smaller project sometimes to inform discovery. It's smaller projects sometimes to even inform which questions to ask critical witnesses, right? That's not, that doesn't necessitate a full blown mock trial, but it does, you know, you can do a smaller focus group and have those kind of more um, uh, tailored research projects to answer specific questions. And that may generate more work or it may not, but the, the goal is you're helping clients to, to get the feedback that they need to move their case forward, even if it's really early on in the process. I wanted to end with just a couple of questions about you. Trial is stressful, we all know. How do you find time to attend to your own mental health needs? I am a firm believer that mental health is critically related to physical health. So I am a, a very passionate fitness person, uh, working out as much as I can, especially on the road, I always have packed stuff in the suitcase or always there. Uh, and I'm always making time because if I don't make time, that means, you know, I'm not prioritizing my physical and mental health. And, you know, it's, it comes with no surprise saying, well, if you, if you work out, you'll feel better mentally because of the endorphins. And, and I'm an absolute believer in that, that and the proper nutrition as well. Um, you, you know, you don't get sick as much and all that stuff, but at the same time, I think you have to prioritize the time that you take for your to be as physically fit as you can because that helps you sleep better when you're on the road helps you deal with the jet lag helps you deal with all the the travel pressures that you have to deal with because you you know your hope that your body is is physically fit to to deal with that and also taking time for yourself even if you're not traveling even if you're not uh you know if you're home with your family you also take time just for yourself it's not that take time for yourself as being around everybody in your family it's just going somewhere, doing something by yourself so you can, you know, rejuvenate and replenish your uh, mental well-being well. Well said. My goal is to have half of my suitcase completely devoted to workout clothes. Okay. Can you talk a little bit about the role mentors have played in your career development? Uh, critically. I mean, I think when I first started in this field, there, there was, you know, a few, it was a small company. So there's few people, everybody's busy, but there are a few people who I kind of latched onto and thought like I would learn as much as I can from them in terms of how they do things and I saw their success. But it's also the the, the other side is they they take the time, right? You know, the there's somebody who's starting out and wants to volunteer and, and say, okay, I'm gonna do right or do as much as I can and get the feedback. So there were a couple of people who gave me the time and were there to give the feedback as much as possible to understand this work that didn't work um, and why and what and what the ultimate message you're sending to clients if this looks this way or doesn't look like that so i was fortunate to have one or two people one mostly who was really just that i'm still friends with and uh, uh you know close to and that informed and and sort of uh, built my my desire to, to provide that to others uh, if you know if somebody wants to, somebody to to help and be mentored and to understand and and lend a lend an ear, uh, provide feedback on written product, provide feedback on client communication and client interactions, because that's that's the only way you're going to learn uh, by doing, especially in this field, uh, to be able to be exposed to that and to get that feedback in a constructive way. Well, thank you so much. You provided a wealth of knowledge today, and I really appreciate you taking the time out, and thank you again. Absolutely. Thank you to Dr. Araf Jabor for speaking with us today, and a special thanks to our listeners. Please join us next time and subscribe to the IMS Insights Podcast. IMS has delivered strategic litigation consulting and expert witness services to leading global law firms and Fortune 500 companies for more than 30 years and in more than 40,000 cases. IMS becomes an extension of your legal team from pre-suit investigation services to discovery and then on to arbitration and trial. Learn more at expertservices.com.